Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to today's Snare Masterclass. Um, our special guest and teacher today is Mr. Brian Prechtel. He is a percussionist in the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. So, Mr. Prechtel, if you could give us a short intro. Hey, great to meet everybody. I'd love to see your pictures if you don't mind turning on your camera. It's just I feel a little strange talking to names. Uh, there you are. Hi. Uh, that's, let's go, Megan. Hi, Megan. Dia. Benjamin, and I assume Jacob will be coming on. So um, I don't know if I've met any of you guys before, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So maybe you could tell me a little bit about yourselves. I am a percussionist in the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. If, I don't know if you can let me share my screen. I can put up a couple of something really quick here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just turn on sharing permission. And also a reminder, um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but if you guys have a PDF of your music that you could share somehow, that would be great. But if not, um, don't worry too much about it. Maybe you could send like a picture or something. Of, of your piece. Yeah, that would be yeah. really helpful to get there. Okay, so here's a little bit about, oh, is that sharing or not? Um, I don't see anything, but I turned on sharing permissions, so it should be on. Oh, one more time. Share screen. Oh, there we go. Start broadcast. Okay. Okay. So, a um, little bit about me. Uh, I am a percussionist in the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Um, I grew up in Connecticut. And I started playing percussion when I was like in fifth grade. First thing I did was pick up a guitar. I loved to play the guitar. And I did that all the way through high school. I still have a guitar back here somewhere. You can probably see it. That I pick up every once in a while. But I realized I couldn't play guitar in the band at school. So I decided, well, I'd play the drums. And, you know, I took some private lessons at Harvard Conservatory. And then I went, the big turning point was for me was going to Hart Summer Youth Music Program uh, in the summer after, I think, my sophomore year. And I decided at that point that I wanted to be an, an orchestral percussionist, much to the chagrin of my mother and father who wanted me to be a doctor or something like that. Um, oh, sorry. I just got a phone call. I'm going to turn that off. And then I decided uh, pretty shortly after that that this is what I wanted to do. And uh, I went to the University of Michigan, got my undergrad, went to Temple University, and got my master's. And then I started getting jobs uh, in the in the orchestra field. You'll see there my resume of, the, of places that I played. Right out of school, I started at the Toledo Symphony, and then I got a job in Columbus. I was in the Fort Wayne Philharmonic for 14 years. And then I got this job kind of at the late age of 40 years old. I got my job in the Baltimore Symphony. That was 18 seasons ago. You can do the math. I am 58 right now. And I spend the summers going to the Grand Teton Music Festival. So that's uh, a little bit about me. So I'm just going to stop this sharing right now. And um, uh, and uh, let tell me a little bit about you guys and what, you, what you're doing in music quickly and uh, and what you hope to get out of this today. Why don't we go around? Megan, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm Megan. Um, I play in um, the Howard County GT Orchestra as a percussionist. Um, so also orchestral percussion. And then um, I am in my school's marching band and symphonic band. And I also- Where do you go to school? Um, I go to Glenville High School. Okay. My son was in Centennial. He was head of the drum line there. He was he was he really into it. <laughs> yeah. So um, from today, I um, just want to learn a little bit more about like how I play and what I can do better. And yeah. Fantastic. Let's go around a little bit next. Let's see, Benjamin. Tell me about yourself. So I'm a upcoming senior at Unionville High School. Um, I also do drum line with ensemble, jazz band, all that. Um, I'm more drum set focused, but um, recently with my uh, teacher, we've been learning um, orchestral music because I think that is a, an important facet of a percussionist. You shouldn't just learn one instrument, you know. Great. Right, right. Dia, tell me about yourself. Um, so I'll be a junior next year. I'm in the Green Hill Band. I'm in the Drumline Concert Band and Jazz Band. And then I was in the Greater Dallas Youth Orchestra last year. So I've done a little bit of orchestral music. And um, yeah. That's great. So you're, you're new to the area here. Mm -hmm. Welcome. And Jacob. 
Um, oh, there you are. <laughs> well, I was actually invited here by Megan. She is my private uh, band teacher at the moment. Um, right now, uh, I'm in band. In, uh, I'm going to be going into seventh grade uh, percussion. Right. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Well, we'll talk a little bit about the snare drum today, and then I'm going to hear you guys play a little bit. Uh, is and if, and if you want to do anything different, just speak up. If you have any questions, speak up. Amy, is that is that what you think should happen now? Yeah, that sounds good. But actually, before we start, can we just take the obligatory Zoom picture? Oh, sure. Okay. I get closer. So, a yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's not so good, then, lighting-wise. How about that? Okay. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, Jacob, hi. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, there we go. Right. So Great. <laughs> All right. I am going to once again share my screen a little bit. Let's see. Where's Zoom? There it is. Okay. Okay, so when it comes to all orchestral playing, but particularly snare drum, it all starts with having good hands. When we talk about good hands, that means that they are, uh, not, first of all, everything you do needs to be relaxed. You need to make sure that you're examining your, your playing for tension at all times. If you're ever gonna teach anybody anything that has to do with music, you have to sleuth out tension and get rid of it because tension is the enemy. Tension will cause you injury. It will not allow you to progress. It will not allow you to get strong. So it's really important that whenever you look at your hands, you say, do they look natural? Do they look relaxed? Okay, even when you're playing difficult or demanding things, you've got to look for relaxed grip and and and. And I'm just going to talk really quickly about the drumstick. Sometimes I'm going to move up here and I'll be a little darker. Let's see if I can turn this light so that you can see me better. Okay. So when I hold the stick, I like, I like it to basically be in this crease right next to – there's a crease in your hand, okay, that's sort of where the fat part of your hand is. I'm going to move this stand back a little so that we get some better light here. So I want to make sure you can see this really well when I put my hand up to the screen. Okay, so see where the stick is right there. It's in this flat, fat, fleshy part of my hand. I don't like the stick out there, okay? And, and again, I'm not your private teacher, so I'm not gonna change everybody's technique, but I feel like when the stick's out there, there's tension already, I feel tension, and I don't feel like I can use my fingers as well. So it really is held, the fulcrum is between the first finger, right here, and the thumb, it's being held like that, okay, and you got a good grip, and then these right on top, and you can use them like that, all right? Neutral is this, okay? I don't like to see students with their hands down like that. I don't like to see them with their hands like with lower than the drum. This is the most ergonomic, the most natural way that your hand should be, and then your wrist just moves up and down. Later on, we might talk about arm movement. I use a pivot movement that goes like this, my elbow kind of goes up. When the stick goes down, that's if, if you use arm. Okay, so those are the mechanics of what we do, all right? But, um, you know, again, being relaxed in all of these things is important. Strength and dexterity are very important. And finger control and arm function, as we talked about, okay? The things that you need to be, be doing as a musician uh, are, are the things that I've outlined here. Excuse me, I'm just moving some things around. And and it's really important that nobody is really going to want to hear you play uh, if if you don't have something to say. So passion and expression are the first two building blocks in, in being a compelling musician. And then dynamics, playing soft, playing loud, playing accents, growing crescendos and diminuendos are really exciting. They give, they're, they're sort of the phrasing that we do. The way somebody could talk like this, they could say all the right things, but if they talked in one monotone all the way across the time, you would very quickly lose interest in what they had to say. Because that's not, it's, it's, it's the phrasing that we do in our voices that keeps people's attention. And it is also the phrasing that we do in our music that, that makes 
uh, people pay attention and gives music meaning. Okay. Um, and, and let's, let's be honest, music is communication. Okay. And you need to, to be thinking, am I saying what I want to say as efficiently as I can? And am I saying it as passionately as, as I can? So those things are really important. Subtlety is another thing. All these little details are, are really important to be a first rate musician. Color is a big, big part of, of what we do in the percussion world. We are the, on the cake, you know, or, or the final highlights that, that a painter might put on the canvas. We, we really supply a lot of the color to the orchestra, to the band, even, even in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a drum set setting, you know, if it's, if it's in a jazz band or, you know, the little fills we do, the little ways we kick the band, things like that. Those are really important little, little bits of color that really make the music come alive. And of course, as I said before, this is communication. So you've got to really think about that first and foremost. Um, also, really important to have a strong sense of time. We are the timekeepers, and that is in any setting, okay? Whether it's in, whether you're behind the drum set or whether you're behind a snare drum or even a mallet instrument or the tip of it, you, you, they, the, the rest of the people in the ensemble depend on us to give that, that, you know, sense of, real steady time. Um, and we could talk about time in more detail, but it's it's crucial. Uh, and, and you only can do that if you've got a strong internal pulse. Okay, I teach that when I teach young kids, and I've been doing this for 30 years, I've been teaching underserved kids uh, and communities in, in, with buckets with five gallon buckets and drumsticks. And, and I teach them from four years old to start developing their inner pulse. Okay, their internal pulse. I call it their invisible clock. And I, I have all kinds of ways that I teach that to little kids. But it is something that even the most advanced musicians are always still working on. I am, I've been doing this a long time and I still am working on my internal pulse. It is important to be constantly trying to improve it. Use the metronome every time you practice. And it again, it is a lifelong pursuit, super important, okay? I'm going to do some of this quickly. This is a lot of a, lar a larger presentation that covers all the instruments, but it is important to realize that you know being a good percussionist means being versatile, and 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 you have to learn all the different instruments, uh, and, and every instrument you have to really embrace. They all have a little bit of a knack to it, you know, whether it's learning how to play the castanets or the tambourine or becoming a hand drummer, and you've got to spend enough time to become proficient. It's really tempting to just concentrate on the things we're good at or the things we like. And you just, if you're gonna be a really effective percussionist, you actually have to spend more time on the things you don't like and that you're not good at. That's, that's difficult, but that's what discipline is about. Sometimes doing the things that aren't easy. Okay, um, let's see. It's important to be knowledgeable. Okay, so you've got to learn the repertoire. You've got to listen to different performances. You've got to talk to other students and attend live performances. Take every opportunity to play the repertoire and to learn it. Uh, and finally, don't depend on how you think you sound or you look. Verify it by taping yourself, videotaping yourself. Play for others. Create the sound you want in your mind. And one of the most important things to succeeding in, in this field is to have drive. To be, you know, there's something about the competitive spirit that mm, sometimes gets a bad rap. I think we've minimized it a lot these days. Uh, you know, everybody gets a trophy and all that kind of thing. But unfortunately, if you're going to be successful in this field, especially if you're going to go into the very competitive field of orchestral percussion, you've got to be able to get up when you get knocked down. And I'll tell you, that is a life skill that will will uh, uh, really serve you well, and no matter what you're doing, not you know, probably. Very few of you are going to say, oh, I want to be an orchestra percussionist. But in everything you do, you're going to face defeats. And you have to have the composure to just stand up once you get knocked down. That's the difference between people that achieve the things that they want to achieve and the ones that don't, is being able to withstand defeat. It is really important. Um, and again, musical support is very important from your family, uh, other other people that care about you. And so that's that's really everything I want to talk about right now. I'm going to skip through some of this because we're not going to be talking about um, 
the orchestra business as much. If we want, we can come back to that. Uh, this I will talk about really quickly. Remember that people skills are very important no matter what you do. It's really important to learn how to talk to different people. Talking to your colleagues is one thing. Talking to a conductor is something else. And learning how to work with members of other sections that don't understand your section as well, or you might not understand theirs. It's really important to always get along with the people that you work with. That's That seems like an obvious thing, but you'd be surprised how many people uh, forget that along the way. The other thing I'm going to talk about is being a good citizen. Whenever you're part of a group, it's incredibly important that you uh, stand up and, and, and do extra. Don't just think about yourself. Don't just think about what you want and what's good for you. Think about the group. Think about serving on committees, supporting and encouraging the people you play with, and reaching out. And I think this, the Do Re Mi uh, organization, to me, sounds like one that's focused on reaching out. So I think you guys, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but it is something to always remember as you move on through this business. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about snare drum now. Do we have any questions before we, uh, before we go on to talking about the snare drum specifically? Amy, any thoughts from you? Um, no, that was great. Thank you. Um, we do just, okay. um, just a time check. We do need a bit of time for each of the performers to play. So that's just something that to keep in mind. Yeah. Absolutely. We have three okay. people playing. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll wrap this up pretty quickly. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I approach the snare drum. It's really important to warm up. All right. When you play the snare drum and I do these warm ups uh, regularly. Uh, and I'm going to just really quickly turn on my my metronome. So you'll see that I always still practice with the metronome. Okay. Uh, let's turn this on. There we go. The mini life jacket's already on. So these are the way that I work on something that's really important. is like working on what I call doubles. So you'll see that I, I play right, left, right, left. And then I do double strokes. But instead of just playing right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left, I actually start with a right and then I put the doubles in. That way you put the weak beat, uh, the weak note out of the double, which is always the second note of the double, onto the strong part of the beat. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first exercise. It's... So you hear that I'm actually putting the second of the double on the beat. That gets me to the point and it makes my double sound really even. Here's it starting with the left. So you can see that that's how I start working on doubles. Then I'll do it in 4-4 four, four time. Right, left, right, left, right, left. Okay, and that helps me. Then I might do an exercise like this bottom one. I'm not sure if you could see it. It might cut off on your page, but I do a, 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 a four bar, four beats of alternating and then the double pattern that I just showed you. So, And that's a really handy way to work on doubles. The other thing that's really important in snare drum playing is to work on your roll. The roll is the number one uh, tool that we have in our belt, and it's really important to work on it. This exercise will help with your soft playing and your loud playing. Again, I will put the metronome on some sort of comfortable speed at first, and then I'll get louder, faster to get loud. As you see, uh, I will start it and I'll get slower for softer playing. So this is sort of in the middle. And you can see that if you look at the accent pattern, it, this is the accent pattern. Like that. And then I roll in that pattern. smooth my roll out. So I'll do that three or four times and then I'll just roll at that speed. So let me do the last time and go into a roll. And then I scroll that same speed and I smooth the roll out. Really important 
to work on smoothing that rollout and filling it in. Okay, we might talk a little bit about that when some of you guys play. So those are some of the basic things that I wanted to make sure I talked about. I'm going to turn on, I, you know, I should have done this earlier. I just turned on my original sound. That might have helped. That might help when I play. All right. So that's sort of a quick intro. Um, let's stop sharing and let's have you guys, uh, let's turn it over to the, the people who want to play for us. Does anybody have their music for me? Because it would be really helpful. If you could just snap a picture of it, maybe put it in the chat or put it, I don't know if you can put that in the chat. Can you? Um, I guess you could email it to me and then I could email it to Mr. Pechtel or Mr. Pechtel, you could put your email in the chat. Why don't I do that? So if everyone just, just takes like a few seconds, like take, get your phone and maybe take a picture of your music. Okay, good. I put a PDF in the chat. Awesome. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it looks like everyone's music is in the chat, so we should be good okay. to go. Okay, good. Here's my email in case anybody wants it. Let's see. Okay, so our first performer is Benjamin Friedman, and he'll be playing Gladstone Cadets by Jonas Pratt. So, Ben, whenever you're ready, you can just unmute. Uh, All right. Okay. Hold on a second. How come I, I can't do that? The, the messages are in the chat. Mm -hmm. Hmm. No, no. <clears throat> For some reason, I only, I'm also getting a really bad echo. Yeah, um, Ben, can you mute while? Okay, can you? Yeah, okay, great. I, okay, yeah. I don't know if you could send those to me, uh, Amy. I'm not seeing them for some reason. I don't know why. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. I don't know why I can't see. All I see is my message in the chat. <laughs> it's really weird. Let me see if it's, yeah. Oh, I see there. I can see them on this chat. Which one is yours, Benjamin? Oh, there um, it is. Yeah, Doc, April 23rd, I think. Okay. All right, well, I, I'll be able to see it here on uh, on my laptop. So hold on a second. It's coming up. Okay, great. Maybe you could spotlight his video so that I can see him and this music at the same time. Oh, I think it should be spotlighted already. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, let me remove it and then do it again. Maybe that'll work. Okay. Great. Oh, not my video. I want you to spotlight uh, Benjamin. Okay. Do you there we go. Him? There we go. That's okay. great. Right. All right. Sounds good. Let's go.
All right. All right. All right. Um, I'm again hearing that echo. There we go. Good. All right. So really good. Nice playing. Difficult piece. Um, I would say that a lot of my comments are probably that I would like to hear more variation and more color. Now, it's difficult on a, pa on a pad because everything kind of sounds the same. But, like, for example, at the end, we really want to know this is the end. Dig it, dig it, up, dig it, dig it, up, blah. I mean, those last two bars, even on a pad, should sound a little bit more pronounced, just a little bit more final. You know, for example, the mezzo forte that's like five lines above that needs definitely needs to be like you should drop down there uh just look for some places to get a little bit softer and and the other thing i think that we need to talk a little bit about is time uh the time especially in the rests was not exactly right look at this page in particular i thought that the in the third measure of the third line uh, that there was definitely not enough time between the downbeat and the end of two. So that's one thing that's really important. And then when it got, and then it started to get a little pushy uh, along around the sixth line where it gets a little, where those double paradiddles are happening. Um, it, it would be helpful for me if you would play uh, this page again um, and play from like, I would say the pickups to the uh, in the third line, pickups to the fourth bar. It's an eighth note pickup to a paradiddle. And if you could actually, can you possibly turn on your metronome while you play this? It would really be helpful. Yeah. So second page. Uh, third line pickups to uh, measure four. Yes. yes. And where would you like me to stop? Uh, well, I, I might let you go to the bottom because it was uh, the double paradiddles that happened in the second line of the bottom. But I just want to hear some of that. But turn on your metronome if you can and play along with it. I think it would be really helpful for us to hear that. All right. You can hear that, right? Yeah, Good. That, that sounds, sounds good. good. That was better. Uh, mute yourself for a second. Let's hear uh, just the last three lines. If you can play the last three lines, the, the, to me, the the third bar of the of the uh, this third line from the end, the, the tempo started getting a little wonky. So let's just really really hone in to keeping keeping those eighth notes steady. One more time. Two bars and make it really dig it, dig it, about dig it, dig it, about blah. Really square. It just feel felt like it was moving around a little bit. Okay. Sorry. Good. I would actually put the eighth, the metronome twice as fast. Put it on the eighth notes. So dig it, dig it, about dig it, dig it, about blah. Because I'm hearing it's just on the quarters, right? I would, I would put it on the eighth notes. Again? Again? Yeah, that's, that's starting to sound a lot, a lot more steady. So my advice to you is actually practice all of this 
with the metronome on eighth notes, okay, rather than on quarters. And, and start to tape yourself, clean it up, find where the problems are. Don't just play through the whole piece. Find your problem spots and focus on those problem spots, okay? Take them apart, put them back together. Really good, good job, Benjamin. All right, let's move on. Who's next? Great job, Benjamin. Sign Yay! Up. Okay, so our next performer is Dia, and she'll be playing Solo 9 from uh, Mitchell Peters' book, I think. And that is Doc 524, that one, right? Yeah. Hold on, I'm, I'm uh, that's opening for me. I'll just take a minute. <laughs> Sorry, taking a second. This is which Mitchell Peters book is this? Intermediate snare drum studies. Uh, I believe it's the advanced snare drum studies. Oh, okay, it would it, it'll be quicker. I probably have it in my file cabinet, but it'll be quicker if I just open this. Hold on, it's almost ready. Oh, there we are. Okay, good. No, I think this is uh, I think this is intermediate now. Okay, here we go. Let's hear it, and maybe we can spotlight. Dia? Oh, there she is. <laughs> okay. I'm ready when you are. Okay, so hold on a second. Uh, that's, that is uh, stopping for me. Like the sound, I can't hear the sound after the first note. Did you turn on original sound? If you could turn on original sound, and you might want to put like a, a towel or something on your drum if you have one handy, just because it's it's going to be so resonant that I think we'll have a, well, I don't know, I'd rather hear a towel if you could do it with it, if you have something like that. The pad is just so, if, if, if it doesn't work, we'll go to pad, but I'd love to hear you put a towel on. That way, we could still hear what it's like on the drum. Yeah, there you go. Just over half of it, not, not over the whole drum, like something like that. I, I just put it over half my drum. Yeah, there we go. Yes. Let's hear what that sounds like. Well, I, I, I'm having trouble. Am I the only one that's having trouble? Um, I can hear it, but it might, I don't know. What about everyone else? Let's, let's go to the pad. Because for me, I hear I hear it, but it just it's it's uh, it's breaking up a little bit. I don't know oh. if that's me, or or let's try it on pad. Sorry. All right, great job, great job. All right, let's go back to the top. There's a couple things I want to talk about. Can you get a metronome out as well? Be really helpful to have it. Okay. 
All right, so um, I want you to play again from the beginning, and 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 like even in the first few bars, it didn't feel I didn't feel the the meter. So it's really important that as the listener, we can always tell what meter you're in immediately. So it should sound like bop, pick it about, jump, pick it about, jump, ba ba da ba da, ba ba da ba da, pick it about. I I really have to feel that that sort of lilt that three feels like. Okay. So if you could put your metronome on eighth notes, da 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 da, whatever speed you were going, I don't think it's quite at two forty. It's probably. I don't know, eight one eighty or something. I don't know. Let's hear. Let's hear what that sounds like. Okay, let's stop. Really good. Much better. I felt the th the, the feel of three there. Now in this bar, one, two, dig it, dig it out, dig it, dig it out, dig it, dig it out, jump. Make sure that, that those 30 seconds fall squarely on the third eighth note of each bar. Okay, you want to start right there for me? Yeah, can your metronome be slightly louder? Do it one more time. Yes, that was much better. Let's do that and go on, please. So let's, I want to hear the next section. Good, good. All right, much better. I thought really good. When you went from the triplet sixteenths back to sixteenths, it took a, like a, a second there for you to to drop back down into the slot. So the the fourth line, third bar should sound like digga 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 up, up 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 up. Those those sixteenths did not seem exactly the right speed. And then when you get to the rolls in the next in the next line, I would not end those rolls. I would go. Okay, I don't think you should go. It seems like you're playing like a nine stroke roll or something and adding an eighth note there like on the second eighth note of that bar and then on the downbeat of the next bar. That's not what's written. Those should be rolls all the way. One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, so I would not put a single stroke at the end of those rolls. Okay. Amy, if we're getting, if we need to move on, let me know. I, I don't want to get too far behind. But let's let's play that for me uh, again, and then let make sure that we, we we drop right back into the slot. Start this time. Start it like uh, the last line of the third, the last measure of the third system. Dig it about, dig it about, dig it about, dig it about. Good. All right. Good. That's better. Let's skip to the very end of this, okay, because uh, there were just a couple things at the end. Again, with that metronome on, I really want to hear, you know, that that time just stay pristine. So in the, uh, from the end, one, two, three, four, five, where you've got that fortissimo starting on the second measure of the fifth line from the fifth line from the end. Big it about, big it a big it a big it about, big it about, big it a big it a big it about, big it a big it a big it a big it a big it about. When you make your just day crescendos, do not change tempo. Let's try it with the metronome. Okay, let's stop. So those 16ths are too fast. I would make your metronome a little slower right now. Just, you want to be able to play this absolutely right. So it's... <laughs> so that you don't slow down there. Whatever it is, whatever speed you can play it, I don't want you to go any faster than that, okay? Try it one more time.
that's closer. So that's this is what I would do. Take it down to something where you could absolutely execute it and then just bump it up one one or two notches at a time, okay? And you'll get that exactly where it needs to be. All right, let's move on. Who else is going to play? Awesome job, Dia. Great job. <laughs> okay, great. So our next performer is Megan Ball. He'll be performing, I believe, an etude from, I don't remember the name of the book, but etude number one. Okay, give me a second to pull that up as well. Great job, Dia. All right. Oh, can you unmute? Yeah, let me know if it like sounds good. Can you hear it okay? It's pretty echoey to me. Uh, maybe you could put a towel on it too, if you don't mind. If you have one. Uh oh. Um, this one can help dampen it, so... Oh, keep playing. Let me hear that a little. What? Play some more. I heard one note. I don't know if I heard more than that. <laughs> Do you have your original sound on? Yeah, I just turned it on. Much better. That's much better. Okay, cool. That makes a big difference. Yeah. Okay, let's hear this. And I'm going to skip like the long repeats. Okay.
an interesting piece. I, I haven't heard that piece before. There's a lot to unpack in that piece. So rather than take it all apart, I'm going to talk about a couple of key things. Um, again, I'm going to talk about time because to me, the, the, the original statement in the first few bars and then when it comes back at the end needs to be a little bit more steady. I, 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 I felt like is what we should hear. And I, I was feeling some instability. So the first thing I would say is to slow it down just like we did with Dia, put that, put, put that, the metronome on the eighth note. And try to get that to do that. Let's just work on that for a second. And then we're going to talk about rolls a little bit. So just play the beginning. If you can put your metronome on while you're playing that, about that speed, just a little bit slower than you were playing it. Uh, it's about that, 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 I would go like there. That's good. Play that speed. Good. So, that's good. But don't be ahead of the metronome. Maybe make the metronome just a little bit faster and then stay right with it. Go ahead. Okay, so there's a tendency to just push the when you get into double strokes, I think it's it just tends to want to be at a certain speed. So try to get that really pristine and then speed it up slowly, okay? Gotta have that steady time, all right? Otherwise it's just a little too distracting. Let's talk about the rolls, okay? So for example, uh, in bar twenty two, you've got all the bars numbered, which is great. Are you're playing are you playing double stroke rolls? Are you playing buzz rolls? What are you playing? Oh, okay, so if you're going to play open double stroke rolls, you know, you got to make sure that that when they get louder, they can open up a little more. So, to me, I would put more hand movements in. What I would do is always, like, add a triplet, a, a triplet hand movement toward the end of a long crescendo roll. So, if you're going to start... You really have to, your hands have to move faster when you play louder rolls or the rolls start sounding really beady. So um, it, it, you've got to find some way to fill those rolls out a little bit. Okay, play, start somewhere, start at the 2-4 that's at the bottom of the first page. All right, do you want um, metronome or? So for example, yeah, maybe. So I would, for example, I would maybe play and like if you're doing duples based rolls in the first bar in that first beat of the second bar i would maybe play a seven stroke roll make three hand movements and that way you can play double stroke rolls but then you get that nice growl at the end of the roll that you really do need yeah like that one more time That sounds much better to me. So that just remember that when you guys play rolls that get louder, louder, louder rolls need more hand movements. They need more strokes or they're going to sound beady. Okay. That's a couple of my little pointers. And I think that's probably where we should stop and see if there's any questions in the last few minutes. Amy, does that sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Awesome job. Megan. Great job. Very well done, everybody. Okay. So let me... Okay, so now we can do like a short Q&A. So if anyone has mis uh, questions for Mr. Proctor, you can either unmute and ask them or put them in the chat. But I guess I can go first. So um, it's a pretty generic question, but I guess what has been your most memorable musical experience, whether that be orchestra, uh, band, um, solo, and why? Well, I mean, one of the most memorable 
experiences for me was probably when I was uh, the uh, just a sophomore in high school, and I was at that Heart Summer Youth music, music Program, and I remember sitting in the band playing timpani on, I think it was a Bach transcription, Fantasia in G major, and I got that feeling where the, the hairs on the back of your neck go up, and as there's this rising bass line, and I just got this incredible feeling. I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. When I That was sort of the moment I got hooked. So I think I was very young. I didn't know anything, but it was the moment that I have been sort of, uh, you know, uh, riding that wave every time I get in the orchestra ever since. So I'd say that's probably one of the most memorable moments for me. But, you know, I'd say recently when the BSO played at the proms in London, that was a pretty great moment as well. So, you know, I think every performance is important and every one of them, you know, feels important to me. But uh, there are a couple that do stand out that way. Awesome. Does anyone else have questions? Oh, yeah. Um, how much of your time is spent actually uh, rehearsing or playing with the BSO? And how much of it is like teaching students and whatnot? Okay, cool. That's a great question. So, um, when, when the BSO has a program, we rehearse usually four times, and then we'll have three or four performances. So, and each of those rehearsals is two and a half hours. Now, there not, might not be percussion on every piece, so sometimes I don't, I'm not required for the whole rehearsal or some entire rehearsals, or even weeks I might not be required. If it's Mozart, I usually don't have to play. But, uh, and, and some weeks take very little preparation. Some take a tremendous amount of pe preparation. If there's a contemporary piece with like a big percussion setup, I might practice that part for weeks. I mean, sometimes more than a month. Lots and lots and lots of hours. And then there's others where I, I barely need to do any preparation at all. Now, of course, I'm also doing other things in my in my top, my practice time because I write music and 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 uh, I've recorded some of my own pieces. We recently just recorded a piece of mine. You can go to Second Pres. Uh, second Presbyterian Concert Series, and you can see a piece that I just wrote for two percussion and strings and piano. Um, so it, it, it depends on the week, and it depends what's going on. I'm also super involved in Orchids, which is our outreach program. So I usually spend, I can spend up to sometimes eight to ten hours a week teaching over there. Now, Orchids just ended for the year, so I'm actually not doing any of that teaching right now. You know, that's the great thing about something like a uh, career music there's a lot of variety in my schedule every week there's a lot of variety day to day and i really like that so yeah great question awesome does anyone else have questions okay um i have a fun one i guess if you could have lunch with a living percussionist who would it be and why well that's a good one um, maybe Steve Reich, if he's, I think he's still alive. Um, he just has changed music so much. He wrote a really important piece called Drumming and a lot of other pieces, and I've never met him, and I, it would be cool. I actually just saw a photo on Instagram of my friend um, um, Colin, who's a percussion soloist, and Steve Reich, and I thought, wow, I, I, would, I would love to meet Steve Reich and have lunch with him. It would be really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I've and... met a lot of the other living percussionists that, you know, the percussion world is kind of small. And so, like, I've met most of the people that are certainly the ones that do orchestral percussion. I mean, you know, I haven't met all the drummers in the world, but, you know, it's kind of a small family. And we have this thing called the Percussive Arts Society that we all belong to. And there's a convention that happens every November. And, you know, you go there and you see, you kind of see all the famous people just like walking around and you end up at a booth next to somebody chatting with Peter Erskine. I was on a, I was on a, a, a committee with Peter Erskine a couple of years ago, and he's one of the most famous drums and players ever. Phenomenal guy. So it's cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, I guess to wrap it up, we could do um, what is like a piece of advice that you wish you had when you were younger? Um, I think this is a good piece of advice for anybody, anywhere, anytime. Don't think that life is going to be uh, out there somewhere. Life is right here. Life is what we're doing now. This is this is life right now. This is a great experience for all of us. And 
you know, getting that job or, you know, uh, getting out of high school or, you know, getting to college is, is it, it, you know, the, 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 we all tell ourselves this this tale that, oh, it's going to be OK when I when I do this or when I do that. And, and if we can start to live in the now and enjoy the now and and be just more grateful uh, for the experiences we're having at this moment. I think we'll all find a lot more happiness. And uh, so that's my, my, my biggest piece of advice. And my second piece of advice is don't say no. Always, if someone asks you to do something, say yes. And even if you don't know how you're going to do it, or you don't think you know how, figure it out. <laughs> you know, say, I'm going to figure out how to do that. When someone came to me and asked me, do you want to have an after school program at this, at this, you know, why in this underserved community? I was like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I said yes. And 30 years later, I'm, I'm still teaching in underserved communities. And it's been the most fulfilling part of what I do um, because I really feel like I'm making a difference in those kids' lives. So say yes. <laughs> well, it's an awesome way to wrap up today's class. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Prechtel, for coming in today to teach our tutors. And bravo to Benjamin, Dia, and Megan for performing. Absolutely. Yeah, you did great, and uh, it's really been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, you know, I wish you guys all the best. Awesome. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Bye. -bye. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.